First in number 70, 18, a row against Wade. The first plaintiff was Jane Rowe, an unmarried pregnant girl who had sought an abortion in the state of Texas and was denied it because of the Texas abortion statute. I got pregnant when I was a teenager. I had a steady boyfriend and, um, you know, birth control failed. This is before Roe v. Wade and before birth control, before the pill was legal. Um, it was really um, medieval. I mean, so what could we do? There was no sex ed. I mean, there, nobody talked about this. This was not anything that was discussed ever. I went up in my bedroom and I thought, I'll just kill myself. That's where I went. I thought, I have shamed everyone. My mother can't talk to me. I can't, there was no one to talk to. You couldn't tell anybody. One in four women actually, you know, has an abortion. But they don't talk about it. It heals me to talk about it. It would heal us all to talk about it. This was 1963. It was 1969. 2016. I just turned 18. I was 22. 18, 33 years old. I had an abortion. It was 1969. I was on my own with the two children, and I met a man who I was pretty serious about. And I got pregnant. And I wasn't supposed to get pregnant because I had an IUD. And he said, oh, it'll be born, they used to say this, with the IUD in its fist. So I went to my doctor, and he said, well, you need to go to Montreal for an abortion. And I realized at that point that my life was not important to this country. And I'm afraid that women will be treated that way again if we can't keep abortion legal. I was 22. Actually, what happened is the condom broke. I just remember going in and telling my parents about it, and he was like, you're so irresponsible. How could you do that? And I looked at him and I said, no, we used a condom and it broke. So do you want me to sue Trojan? Or what would you like me to do at this point? And then he kind of snapped out of it and he was like, oh, okay. I know that there was no way that I could raise a family at that time. You know, I was still living at home with my parents and they would be helping me raise this child. And that's not what they wanted to do either. Let's not go too far, okay? Can the fire truck come back this way? I found out that I was pregnant in um, February of 2016. We were going to tell our parents, and we bought Clara a big sister shirt. <laughs> it became really apparent that there was something seriously wrong. The baby had a fatal anomaly that could not be fixed with surgery and that it was incompatible with life. Um, the doctor had explained that continuing the pregnancy carried some health risks for me. I knew that I wanted to be able to have another baby and I didn't want to face uh, more fertility troubles. Um, so at that point, we did decide that we wanted to end the pregnancy. Come on, buddy. Ah, oh, nice. Come on. Come on, little man. Come on. Can you go inside? I'm lucky enough at 32, I found 
the best partner in my husband who's going to be just the optimal co-parent. I, I can't imagine picking a better person. And I can't wait to be a mom. <laughs> I can't wait to have kids. And, you know, that is not where I was 12 years ago when I was getting the results of my pregnancy test. I was not emotionally or financially or even physically ready to do that at 20. And continuing my pregnancy and having a child would have been compromising not, not only my opportunities, but also my children's opportunities. If I don't have the money to get myself groceries, I can't think about having a baby. <laughs> Deciding to get an abortion, that was the responsible choice. I didn't know this, but then when abortion was illegal, women had a kind of a network. Like, I don't even know how it existed. It was all underground. No one ever talked about it. A neighbor came back and she said, OK, this is what I have found. There is a man in Pennsylvania. His daughter died from an illegal abortion. He's a doctor, and he's helping to make sure that nobody else dies. And I remember telling him that, that I had always wanted to have a baby, but I, I just couldn't do it then. And so he said, I promise you, you will be able to have children after. And I said, OK. Uh, I had an anesthesia, so I was asleep, and I don't know how long it took, and I woke up, and then my dad came in, and then within an hour, we left. We didn't talk the whole way driving, which was several hours, and then he hugged me goodbye, and we never spoke of it, ever. And my mother, nobody, we never spoke of it again. It's like, this didn't happen, put it away in some other part of your mind and just don't think about it. I didn't know much about, you know, illegal abortions at all. Two nurses were having a conversation over me and I said, is this an abortion? And everybody went, oh. Was Roe was just way past yet? Or no, no was... this was in 1966, 1966. But the person who we w I went to was an orderly in a hospital. He was not a doctor. And then when we went in, it was a Saturday. All of the lights in the office were off because they didn't want people to know that they were using, it was a dentist's office, and they didn't want people to know they were using that office for anything. So that was really creepy, and, um, you know, the guy was competent. Even within the Grandmothers for Reproductive Rights that I belong to, which has the wonderful acronym of GRR, there's still stigma. And you don't know who of your friends might feel offended or upset or think ill of you. And it's, it's pretty scary to think that loving somebody or being foolish can affect you in such a way that puts you in a position where you're made to feel ashamed. We want to have children when we want to have children, and we don't want to have them when we don't. You know, I'm grateful that I had a choice and that that was the choice I was able to make. Who knows what it would have happened if I'd maintained the pregnancy and had that child. I wouldn't have two wonderful children and my husband. I don't think I would have gone as far as I have in my career or professionally, especially in healthcare. Women have done this for centuries. Women are going to make this choice regardless of whether it's legal or not. Isn't it nice that we can do it safely and legally and women don't have to die doing it? And wouldn't it be awful if people were going to back rooms to have it done by somebody who's not a doctor?
I mean, that just seems crazy. It's barbaric. I always wanted to have two kids. <laughs> it was not an easy road to get here. It was not what we expected. And if I hadn't been able to end the pregnancy, I wouldn't have gotten pregnant with my daughter, Daphne. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have that family that I have today, the family that I love so much. When I would share my story, people would say to me, well, that's not really an abortion, or your experience doesn't really count. I think it was to try and make me feel better in some way, but it actually made me really upset. Like, I couldn't be a good mother and also have had an abortion. I guess it just made me really angry that outside judgment mattered at all in my decision or anyone else's decision. I didn't need someone's outside judgment saying whether it was good or bad. It just, it was the decision I made and it's not better or worse than the reasoning for anyone else who makes that decision. And I just imagine like, what if some strangers just came in and got to weigh in on that choice without knowing anything about us or our family? That's what it feels like. Mama. You know, even if, if you're starting off fairly liberal and progressive and believing in the right to choose, I think that there are still internalized stigmas that exist that we may not even be aware of. Too young or promiscuous or irresponsible or, you know, those women who get multiple abortions and all of these, these easy judgments that a lot of us are not challenged to slow down and investigate were all of a sudden in my face. And I realized that people who got abortions were humans and my peers. And that was a very quick shift. This is a place in my life where my hard work and my planning is finally culminating into a way that I can acknowledge as success. And that's what I have worked so hard to set myself up for, is to feel just as confident in this moment that I could raise a healthy, happy kid as I did at 20, knowing that I couldn't. You were a good looking. Good looking couple. Yeah, we were. I met Jim working at um, a drug and alcohol treatment program. <laughs> we got married in 1970 and then had, um, had our daughter, who is the light of my life. I'm the voice of a lot of women of my generation who died. Who died. So I'm representing them now, and um, I'm speaking for them. I don't want um, anybody to go through that. <sighs> we started going door to door and just saying, knock, 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 we open the door. Hi, my name is Susan, and I'd like to talk to you about abortion. This lady comes out, and we talked for a few minutes, and she was very religious. And after a few minutes, I told her that I had had an abortion, and I told her my story. She listened so intently, and then she said, you know, I wasn't in your shoes. I would never judge you for what you've done. And I thought, oh my God, I had tears, you know, really. And she said, um, after we talk more, she said, the last thing I want is for a bunch of old white men to be telling us what we should do, right? And I thought, I love you. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
<laughs> oh, and so and and at the end, which was about a twenty-five minute conversation, um, we hugged, and I thanked her for being so non-judgmental. I said, you know, this has meant so much to me that. I have this in my life and that you don't think I'm a horrible person. And she said, well, you're clearly not a horrible person, and I'm sorry you had to go through all of that. You know, she says, I don't agree with what you, your decision, but I understand. <laughs>